the glory of God is the manifest beauty of His holiness. It's the going public of His holiness. It's, it's the way He puts His holiness on display for, for people to apprehend. The heavens are telling the glory of God. What does that mean? It means He's shouting at us. He shouts with clouds. He shouts with blue expanse. He shouts with gold on the horizons. He shouts with galaxies and stars. He's shouting, I am glorious. Open your eyes. Do you see it? Do you love it? You were made for this. I'm made for this. This is why I exist to see that. Everything is pointing to that. All the glory that I thought was so attractive is going there. This is all husks and ashes. Now we see through a glass darkly. Then, face to face, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. So the glory that's coming is of such an all-satisfying, infinitely beautiful, totally need-meeting and joy-producing kind. 80 years of pain will be as nothing. This light, momentary affliction is working for us an eternal weight of what? Glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. God is aiming that we see and savor and treasure His glory, the riches of His glory. So I ask, do you see it? Do you love it? And I'll say again, you were made for this. Praise the eternal, praise the immortal, for you are holy, God. Oh
Good morning, church family. Good morning, and welcome to another Sunday at Central Community Church. You know, I'm so glad that you're, you chose to worship with us this morning. And we're, I'm excited that, about all the things that God has been doing and will do for our congregation in the future. I think as we get through this pandemic, as we work our way through it, I think things are going to... There's a light that's beginning to shine at the end of this long, dark tunnel. You know, lives are being changed, though, folks. I want you to know that lives are being changed throughout this by the power of God. And there can be little doubt that we have very little power on our own for lasting change to really happen in our lives. Yet we choose to... F when we choose to allow the Lord to lead and to guide us, you know what? Amazing, amazing things can happen. So if this is your first time worshiping with us, please know that you're more than welcome to, to just stick, stick with us and join us and sing with us, pray with us. And we trust that you'll feel the warmth this morning. And you also feel it on a weekly basis and when we gather back here again. You know, our desire more than anything is to lift up the name of Jesus in our worship as the family of God and really to bring honor to his name. You know, Psalm 100 verses 3 through 5 says, says this. It says, acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and go into the courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. So let's enjoy the day. Let's pray. Our Father God, Lord, we have gathered here again in your presence online, on our tablets and computers and our televisions, wherever we are. But Lord, you are our God in heaven. You made all the earth through your word. And we exalt you for the power and the goodness. And we come to you to show you, come to you to show our love for you. We've cast all of our cares before you and on you. And Lord, so bring us abundance and remove, remove the lack from our lives. And may we just be renewed through you. Give us the, give us the strength to, to face the week, weeks ahead. And Lord, just allow us to glorify your name. We worship you because you are our God. You are our God forever. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God.
Friday And with each passing moment Strength I find To meet my trials here Trusting in The Father's wise bestowment I have no cause For worry or for fear He who sought His kind beyond all measure Gives unto Each day what He deems best Lovingly It's part of pain and pleasure is near me with a special mercy for each hour all my cares he fain would bear and cheer me he whose name is counselor and power the protection of his child and treasure a chart that on himself he lay as thy days thy strength shall be in measure this the pledge to me he has made So to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, uh, to take as from a father's hand one by one the day the moment fleeting till I reach the promised land
rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself. Isn't it great to have Nathan back playing some music for us? Yeah, it is. I, I, he sent some more stuff out, and we just downloaded it, and he got it all ready for us. I really appreciate what they're doing for us at Reawaken Hymns. Folks, we're going to continue on part five of our, our, our Savior series. This one is entitled The Damascus Road, Sermon 5. And we're going to continue our ser- It's right through the book of Acts. Okay, so we're taking most of this from. We're particularly going to look at the conversion accounts that are given to us in this book, uh, the book of Acts, which chronicles the beginning and the initial spread of the early church. Now, we spent the last two weeks with the preacher Philip, if you remember, as he went to the city of Samaria and he established, he established a church there. And then he was suddenly, if you remember last week, he was called away. He was called away to the south to meet a man on the Gaza Road and convert him to Christ, the man from Ethiopia, if you remember. But today we're going to leave Philip as he goes to do his work elsewhere, and, and we're going to travel to another famous road. This time we're going to go to the north, uh, to the Damascus Road. One of the most famous and powerful stories of conversion to Christ began along this ancient road. We meet a man that was so feared by the early church, but who will soon, be, soon become one of its greatest leaders and champions. Saul. We're going to meet Saul, who later would become the great apostle Paul. Read with me as we go through Acts 9, verses 1 through 8. In fact, the first verse actually describes what what the people thought about Saul. Listen to this. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of... If he found any... If he found any who were of the, of the way, whether man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a bright light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Say out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now this is one of the three occasions where either Luke or Paul himself recounts the story of Saul's conversion. This account in Acts 9 that I just read, and later told by Paul himself in Acts 22, after his arrest at the temple, then in Acts 26, as Paul stands before Agrippa, when we put these three accounts together, um, a powerful story emerges of how one of Christ's greatest enemies of how Christ, one of, one of Christ's greatest enemies, became one of his most devoted disciples. Today we're going to talk about Saul's experience along, this, along the Damascus Road. We'll pose the question, what, should we expect to have a Damascus Road experience today? Should we? Is that how people are saved today? Saul of Tarsus was an angry man, folks. He was an angry man full of what, what he would consider righteous indignation. He was on a dreadful, merciless mission to eradicate the church of Christ from the face of this earth. He he actually viewed the church 
as an enemy of God and a threat to everything that he believed, everything he believed, and, he, and, and he, everything that he held dear in his life up to that time. Saul, you see, was a distinguished member of the Pharisee sect. He was an educated and pedigreed Jew, zealous for God and the nation of Israel. He viewed everyone who challenged the traditions of the Pharisees or the law of Moses as a dangerous heretic. Anyone who followed Jesus and dared to speak his name was a blasphemer to Saul. And their movement must be put down. He thought it must be stopped. This is how we find Saul as we turn to Acts 9. You, you recall he was introduced to us actually in Acts 7. As the angry mob was picking up stones with which to kill Stephen at his fiery sermon, after his fiery sermon. In fact, Acts 7, 58 says, And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. When we next see Saul, he's going throughout the land, seething with hatred for followers of this Christ and breathing out threats of imprisonment and death against them. He has gone to the high priest, folks. He has gone to the high priest in Jerusalem to obtain letters that would now empower him to go to the synagogue in Damascus to the north and arrest any that he found were, were out of, were, that were of the way, the way of Christ. And he was going to bring them back to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. That's who Saul of Tarsus was, and that's what he was doing. But God, folks, amazingly, God had other plans for him. God had other plans for him. Little did Saul know, little did Saul know that his world was about to be, his world was about to be turned upside down when he left Jerusalem and headed for Damascus. I want to pause right here to say that, that if God could make that kind of transformation in the life of someone like Saul of Tarsus that he did, then I'm telling you that he can make that kind of transformation right now in your life. I don't care where you are in your life. It doesn't matter. If God was interested in the salvation of a man who was doing the things that Saul of Tarsus was doing, my friends... I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of sin that you've been involved in or how far down in the gutter that you've gone, how opposed you may be to the truth of God. The fact of the matter is, and I'm telling you this, if God was interested in a man like Saul, then I'm telling you God is interested in you. And you people that I know, you know who I'm talking to. You know that. He's interested in your soul. He's interested in your salvation. And his gospel, folks, his gospel is powerful enough to save you if you have room in your heart to repent of your sins. That's all it is. If you have room in your heart to repent of your sins. And as we will see today, Saul did. Saul was on the road to Damascus outside of the city at about noon when verse 3 tells us that suddenly, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And Paul later says this about that light in Acts 26, 13. He says, at midday, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. He fell to the ground. He fell to the ground and heard a voice and it was the voice of Jesus in Acts 14 of Acts 26. In verse 14, sorry, of Acts 26, it says, And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. I want you to notice as he, as he persecuted the church, Jesus says, you are persecuting me. When you despise the church of the Lord Jesus, you are despising, despising the Lord Jesus himself. When you, when you abuse and neglect the, uh, the church of the Lord Jesus, you're abusing and neglecting the Lord himself. 
Saul asks at this point what I believe are the two greatest and most important questions that any person can ever ask in verses 5 and 6 of Acts 9. It goes like this. I'll read it again. And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling, so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Friends, you can never ask any question of anyone that will be of as great consequence as those two questions that Saul asked. Have you seriously and sincerely asked them yourself? Who are you, Lord? Hey, Lord, what do you want me to do? That really captures the theme of the last several studies, the last several sermons that we've had here, if you think about it. But, you know, first of all, who is Jesus? Who, who is Jesus? Where did he come from? What did he come to this earth to do? And then, what does Jesus want me to do? You cannot, you cannot afford to not ask those questions, and you don't want to ignore the answers to those questions. It's not enough to ask, what should I do? Because, because doing won't save without knowing. It's also not enough to ask who you are, Lord, because knowing won't save you without doing. Saul asked both these questions of Christ. Once he knew who Jesus truly was, his next question logically follows. What does this Jesus want me to do? Up until this point, Saul didn't know either one. He ignorantly opposed Christ because he didn't understand. He did not understand who Jesus was. He didn't. But now in this great encounter and in this revelation, he encounters the very presence and the voice of Jesus on the Damascus road. And, and you know what? And he is alive. Folks, and he is alive. The crucified Jesus, whom Saul considered a fraud, a blasphemer, a heretic, a dangerous false prophet. The crucified Jesus, who met his end on that Roman cross a few years before. Oh, his followers were claiming that he rose from the dead, but Saul didn't believe that. He thought they were delusional or just deceivers. But now, everything changes. Everything changes. Now he knows it wasn't a lie. He knows, he himself knows that, yes, Jesus is alive. And if he is alive, that means G that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He really is the Christ. He really is the promised Messiah. You see that? He could see that now. He understood it. Clearly, the prophet, the priest, and king from that, that the old system, the Old Testament foreshadowed, that he so sincerely believed that. Friends, everything hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus. Everything hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything he claimed about himself is true. You have to contend with the facts of the resurrection, folks. Now, Saul comes face to face with the facts of the resurrection. When he now comes to realize that Jesus, whom he had opposed and denied, is indeed the risen Christ. He now comes the crushing guilt to Paul of what he'd been doing. He'd been reviling and opposing God himself. He'd been working against the plan of God and he was, per and he was persecuting the church of God. In that moment, with the light of, when that light of heaven blinded him and the voice of Jesus spoke to him, his world came crashing down. And all he could do was cry out in contrition, Lord, uh, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I do? Friends, when you and I truly come to understand, truly come to understand who Jesus is, that's the only thing left for each of us to say as well. What do you want me to do, Lord? Let's stop and think about what Saul has just experienced. Think about it. He saw a great light. 
And he heard a voice from heaven, not just any voice, but the very voice of Jesus. He is convicted then of his sins. And this is a great experience that Saul had on the Damascus Road. Why did he have such an experience, a supernatural experience? Why? And should sinners who come to Christ, should they expect such an experience in that process today? Some people say that salvation can come in many different ways. Maybe a still, small voice through a very discreet, quiet process. Others claim that they're saved through a Damascus Road kind of experience. There have been many claims of a like or similar experience to what Saul had. You might hear someone say that, that they too saw a light or heard a voice. That Christ spoke to them. Or they had some sort of, some sort of great vision. But usually the testimony of such experiences is meant to corroborate that the person was saved in some kind of supernatural encounter. But is that what happened here to Saul? First, notice that when Jesus spoke to Saul, others heard a voice at the same time. Verse 7 says, And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. So it wasn't just Saul that heard the voice. They heard a voice speaking, but they didn't hear what was being said. Didn't say they heard. They heard somebody speaking. They didn't know what was being said. Bible critics have long alleged a contradiction between Luke's account here in Acts 9 and Paul's later account in Acts 22 because Luke says that others heard the voice. But Paul says others did not hear the voice. You see. And, and that's important to see that. Well, that's really not a contradiction. What it simply means is that they, they heard a voice speaking, but they didn't hear what was being said. They could certainly tell that someone was saying something, and it was a supernatural encounter. But they could not see the person speaking. They could not see that person speaking. In other words, this is not some still, small voice whispering to Saul that he later made claims to others about. Saul had witnesses to the fact that someone spoke to him on that road. It's strange to me that people claim that some special revelation came to them, some special came to them in the middle of the night, in some soft whisper or feeling that swept over them and compared it to Saul's experience. But here, all who were around Saul heard that voice as Christ spoke to him. The Bible says it left them all speechless. They were amazed. But why? But why did the Lord appear to Saul? Why did this encounter even happen? Why did he come to Saul on Damascus Road and speak to him? Is that how the Lord saves people today? Is, he, is, is it how he saved people even then? You know, the answer may be surprise you, but, but really the answer is no. No, we're going to see in a moment that Saul was not saved on the road to Damascus. No. The events on the Damascus roads helped lead to Saul being saved, yes. But he was yet still in his sins, folks, when he left that place on the road. And Paul himself tells us why Christ appeared to him in this special revelation, and it had nothing to do with the manner in which people are saved today, okay? Let's notice a, a few pertinent passages. In Paul's account in Acts 22, when Ananias came to him a few days later to restore his sight, he said this in Acts 22, verses 14 and 15. Um, then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Okay, but what's that all about? Why was it necessary for Saul to see and hear the just on just, just on Jesus directly? Okay, if you remember in Acts 1, after the defection and the death of Judas, when the apostles were choosing Judas as a replacement, they noted that to be an apostle, one had to have been with the Lord. In Acts verse 122, which actually says this, Beginning from baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Oh boy, you see that, right? 
You see that. And that's important to know that. And the apostles had seen him after the resurrection. Later, well, after Paul's conversion, when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that Christ was raised from the dead. He then lists the occurrences of when Jesus appeared to the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 through 9. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Did you catch what Paul said there? He said he was the last person to see Jesus after the resurrection. The other apostles saw him immediately after the resurrection. Immediately. Including John, who later received the revelation. You see that? And that's important. But the fact is, Paul was the last apostle to see Jesus. The risen Lord, the last one. But Paul saw him on the road to Damascus when Jesus made this unusual, one-of-a-kind appearance to Saul. And it was for the express purpose of making Paul the last one of his apostles. Wow. The apostle that he would especially dispatch to the Gentile world and to the Gentile church. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1 says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? So this was the reason that Christ reached Saul, folks, in the extraordinary way that he did. Christ is, Christ is not making more apostles today. He's not. Not only that, but Saul was not saved on the road to Damascus anyway. He wasn't saved there. And the text actually bears that out. Christ appeared to him, and Saul became convicted of his sinful state. Yes, indeed. He now realizes he's been wrong. What did Saul then ask, and how did Jesus answer in verses 5 and 6? We'll read them again for the third time. I'll read it again. He said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city. And you'll be told what you must do. You see, Jesus didn't tell him what he had to do. He sent him to wait in Damascus until someone came to him and told him what to do. So you think, okay, well, why is that? Remember what we learned last week in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7? It actually says this, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that's us, okay, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. God commissioned men to preach the gospel and tell others what to do to be saved. Friends, no one is saved by Jesus. No one is saved by Jesus speaking to them and telling them what to do to be saved. No one. No one is saved through the lights and voices and visions and feelings and dreams and experience. No one. No one. In fact, here it is an axiomatic statement that is without exception in the New Testament after the Great Commission was given to the apostles. No one is saved but by hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, and obeying the gospel. It's just as plain and simple as that. I'll say it again. No one is saved by hearing the gospel, by believing the gospel, and obeying the gospel. No one. Christ appeared, he spoke to Paul, in order to arrange a meeting with Ananias in Damascus, who then came and told him what to do to be saved. And he qualified Paul for the office that he would hold after his conversion, to be a chosen apostle, an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this experience on the Damascus road was really all about. It really was. So now let's, let's, follow, let's follow Saul into the city, into Damascus. Now he's blind, remember? He's blind after encountering Jesus. He's led by the hand into Damascus, into a house where he spends three days fasting and praying. And one may say if the experience of the Damascus rose didn't get Paul, uh, Saul saved, surely three days of fasting and praying did. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about what Saul was praying for. It doesn't say that. We might could well imagine 
but the Bible doesn't say. Okay, remember that. These were three days of suspense as Saul is waiting for God's man, God's person, to come to him to answer his burning question that he posed for, to Christ. Lord, what will you have me do? He has not heard the answer to that question yet. And I'm sure, really, that he's anxious, he's confused, he's excited. We, can, we, can, we might imagine even what his prayers might have been like and how fervent they must have been. You know, after all, remember now, Saul was, really was a devout, devoutly pious and religious man. But keep in mind that while he is fasting and praying, he still has not heard what he's supposed to do. He's waiting to hear what to do. And that answer did not come until after Ananias comes to him in the house of Judas. You know, we used to hear a lot about mourner's benches and, and praying, through, praying through things. That one would seek salvation by praying sometimes for hours or even days or weeks until finally the light broke through and the person had some assurance that God had heard and answered their prayer and they had been gloriously saved. Nowadays, most people are simply told by preachers and revivalists that to be saved... You just quietly bow your head and, and where you are and you pray the sinner's prayer. But I'm going to tell you, there's not one word in this story or any other story in the book of Acts of a person simply verbally inviting Jesus into their heart by saying a prayer or about praying through until salvation come. Nowhere does it say that. It's simply not there. Saul is just spending these days waiting for Ananias to come by praying. And notice what happens when Ananias, when Ananias comes in Acts 9, verse 17. It says this. And, I, and Ananias, oops, that word gets a little hard sometimes. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he had to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to do the work of an apostle. That couldn't happen until he first had his sins forgiven and entered into Christ, becoming a disciple himself. So we go on to the next verse in Acts 9, 18, which says, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. Paul himself gives us an even more detailed account of what Ananias said when he came to him. Acts 22 says in verse 12, 13, it says, Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Now some people say that the fact that Ananias called Saul Brother Saul indicated that Saul was already saved. But if you go back and look at verse 5, it shows that, Jew, the, that Jews called one another brother all the time, or brethren, upon their mutual Jewish heritage. That's all that refers to. Now, Acts 22, verses 14 and 16, the next three verses, goes like this. It says, Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. There it is, my dear friends. There it is. Saul wanted to know, who are you, Lord? By this point, he already knows the answer to that question. And now the question is, what do you want me to do? And Jesus tells him to go into the city. And wait for one who will come and tell him what to do. And Saul goes, he waits, and Ananias comes and commands him, Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You see, until he was baptized, he was still in his, in his sins, and had not yet called on the name of, the name of the Lord for salvation. He heard, he believed, and now he obeys the gospel. You hear that? He heard, he believed, and now he obeyed the gospel. Just like every single person who would be saved must do even today. You must hear, you must believe, and you must obey the gospel. 
Paul went forth. He became one of the most devoted disciples that Jesus Christ ever had. And one of the greatest heralds of the crucified and risen Lord that the world has ever known or will ever know. My question for all of you this morning is why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? That's the question. Don't wait for that Damascus Road experience. That was to make this man uniquely an apostle, the last apostle for Jesus Christ. Salvation came when he, knowing, not knowing who Jesus is, believed and obeyed what Ananias told him, what the Lord required of him. So I ask every one of you again, what, what are you waiting for? If you haven't, you need to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And in so doing, call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, my God, Lord, teach our hearts this day where and how to see you, where and how to find you. You have made us, Lord, you've remade us, and you've bestowed on us all the good things that we possess. And we still do not know you. We have not yet done that for which we were made. So, Father, teach us to seek you, for we cannot seek you unless you teach us or find you unless you show yourself to us. Let us seek you in our desire. Let us desire you in our seeking. Lord, let us just find you by loving you. And let us love you when we find you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In your love was an ocean when my life was running dry and your name was a refuge through every single trial and i know i know i know you were beside me and i know i know i know you are beside me here and high on the mountain top i'm taking in your love Look back at all you've done, you're with me, you're with me, and I can't believe my eyes, still after all this time, you never left my side, you
Let's close in prayer, folks. Lord, we thank you for revealing your unconditional love to us through your word. We thank you for making it possible for us to share this love this morning. And Lord, as we go about the rest of the days and weeks ahead, open our eyes that we might see wondrous things in the word that we have heard and shared. Let those who have joined us online this morning with broken hearts depart when they are revived and restored. Help us to continue living and walking according to your word, Lord, not by what we see. And Father God, help us just to turn our, eye, our eyes away from, from worthless things so that we can focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we leave each other now, guide us in the weeks ahead so that we can reach our destination safely. Help us to submit and rely on you alone. And direct our paths and give us confidence to follow in any direction that you may choose to guide us. And may we thrive in all areas as we can be firmly rooted in your love. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, I want to thank you for joining us. Keep praying that we one day will get through this. One day, step by step by step, we will make it and we will be back here again. And that's what we need to be praying about. I miss you all. Don't forget Tuesday nights at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it's our fellowship and prayer night. Just a good time of conversation and chat, a little study in the Word, really, and you know, whatever. And just a time of prayer. We think we can pray for each other. Hey, I want to encourage you to join us for that. And it's a good time, like I say, to connect with each other for those that you haven't seen for a while. I really would encourage that. Don't forget to call each other, check on each other, see how each other's doing. Make it a real church family. Okay, guys, I, want to, I miss you all. We'll be back again next week. I hope to see you all online next week. Hey, God bless you all. Love you and see you then. Bye-bye now.